Today, Pastor Javen continues our series on Genesis, and we see that the longing of our soul cannot be filled apart from God. So take a moment now and prepare your heart for today's service. Some people do crazy things uh, for love. Maybe, maybe you're one of those. Maybe you did something crazy for love in, in your life at, at one point in time. There was a, uh, there was a trend that started, uh, it, was, it was happening last year where people were online. They, it was a question that was asked for men to share the, uh, their worst attempt or their worst experience from an attempt at love in their life. And so about a year ago, this trend happened and, and this one instance went viral. Uh, a man from Mexico shared his experience. Uh, when he shared it about a year ago, there was, it had over 14 million views at the time he shared it, when he shared it. But the man shared that he, he had a girlfriend and his girlfriend's mother was in need of a kidney. And so this man gave one of his kidneys to her mom to save her life. Saved her life. She started doing better. About a month after the, uh, the surgery, the girlfriend dumped him and married another man. And so that story went viral, right? Now, we don't know the whole story, but that's, if that's, the, the, that's it, that's, a, that's cold. I mean, that's just cold. Ladies, that's cold, right? I mean, that's, that's rough. And that's a bad love experience in love, right? But as we move on in, in our look at Genesis, we're going to come to a passage of Scripture where we see this same type of crazy love story in this instance that takes place. As we've been going through our, our look at Genesis and we've looked at the origin story of, uh, of the world and of creation and of our faith, we have seen a lot of things. We've seen the creation of the world. We've seen the creation of man. We've seen the fall of man into sin. We've seen the flood in the time of Noah. We've seen the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. We have seen the, the sacrifice and the surrender of Abraham as the promise of God was initiated with him and the birth of, uh, of, of the faith and the birth of the Israel nation, of the nation of Israel. It, it's, as it moved from Abraham, the story moved to Isaac. And we saw last week the dysfunction in the family of Isaac between him and Rebekah and Esau and Jacob and all the deception that was taking place. And every week we've been learning this truth that we were trying to hold on to in our life from what took place in the lives of those at at the very beginning. And this week's no different. And here's the truth that I want us to get out of today. Here's what I hope that we take home with us. And that is the fact that the longings of your soul will never be fulfilled outside of the creator of your soul. The longings of your soul will be fulfilled when you truly begin to praise your creator. When you begin to praise your creator, then you'll begin to feel the longings of your soul fulfilled. Now, we've already seen last week uh, Jacob's uh, dream and his vision that he had, this, the, the one that's so famously called uh, Jacob's Ladder. Maybe you've heard that terminology before. Um, but, uh, but he had this dream and, he, and, and, and this vision and God had told him what he needed to do. He had given them, given him the promises that he had given to Abraham, his grandfather. He gave him the promises that he gave to his dad, Isaac. Now he's given them to Jacob. Jacob hears those and he begins his journey and his journey takes him to a place in the first spot that he stops. It's interesting. He stops at this well. And while he's at the well, this is why it's interesting. He meets this woman that he finds very attractive. Now, his dad, Isaac, his dad, Isaac didn't find, if you remember from last week, he didn't find his own spouse. This was how they did it. Remember that? Were you, you like my friend? Will you go out with him? Right. This, the servant of Abraham went and found the spouse for Isaac, but they found Isaac's spouse, Rebecca, at a place where she was drawing water. Ah, interesting, right? So Jacob's going to find a woman that he likes where she comes to draw water. And I love the details in the Bible. Genesis chapter 29, verse 10. Look at, look at what it says about Jacob when he sees this woman. He went over to the well and he moved the stone from its mouth and watered his uncle's flocks. Why do I like that? Because this reveals to us that Jacob is a typical stereotypical male. All right. He often gets displayed as, as effeminate because he grew up a mama's boy in the kitchen, liking to cook with smooth skin. Right. So we always take the way we're introduced to Jacob and make him sound like he's an effeminate guy, but we're going to discover Jacob is a stereotypical male. He does what any stereotypical guy would do when they see a woman, they think is attractive. They all of a sudden try to make themselves, I, mean, I got to move this stone. I mean, you know, I got to make him got to flex, make the muscles pop. He wants her to notice him, right? 
Well, let's look at this. We're going to look at this situation that happens. Genesis chapter 29. We're going to start at verse 13. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. We're going to read through this passage of Scripture. I may pause a couple of times, but we're going to read through this passage of Scripture to see what's happening here in the life of Jacob. Genesis chapter 29, start at verse 13. As soon as Laban heard that his nephew Jacob had arrived, he ran out to meet him and he embraced and he kissed him and brought him home. And when Jacob had told him his story, Laban exclaimed, you really are my flesh and blood. I I find this statement interesting because I don't know why Jacob's making that expression. We're going to see in a minute. Maybe Jacob is hearing who all is a part of his family and he's saying, yeah, you really are my family. Or Jacob's hearing, or Laban's hearing his story of deception. Because we're going to find out Laban is a lot like Jacob. And he's thinking, you are a lot, you are my family. All right, we are kin. So we keep going. Now, Laban had two daughters. The older daughter was named Leah and the younger one was Rachel. There was no sparkle in Leah's eyes, but Rachel had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. I get it. This sounds like, wow. All right. We're just being very superficial here, aren't we? I get it. It's harsh to hear this, uh, and, and, and see this, but basically what Moses is doing, the writer of Genesis is he is putting out there that there is a difference in the appearance and how one was appeared to another from the, from the outward appearance. All right. So we keep going. Since Jacob was in love with Rachel, he told her father, I'll work for you for seven years. If you'll give me Rachel, your younger daughter as my wife again, real quick, want to pause here. I'm sorry. We're going to get through the passage. And yes, I want to, to hit the fact we talked about this early in the series. You're, you're reading this. And I know some of you won't be able to get by the fact that they're related. Okay. Yes. In the early part of creation, incest was a part of that. Now, if God created man and woman and he made Adam and Eve and there was only the two of them and he told them to be fruitful and multiply, common sense tells you this is going to have to be a part of the beginning of the story, right? In early patriarchal times, and the, such significant lines were drawn between those who followed God and those who didn't follow God. And you did not need to walk out of that because if you did, you were walking out of the covering of God. You were falling into temptation. You were beginning to walk into sin. All of this was held pretty strictly. And a lot of this was taking place. But as we go further in the Bible and we begin to see God lay out the way man should relate to God and man should, and, and man should relate one to another. When God is speaking to Moses, he lets them know that incestuous relationships relationships need to be off limits. All right. We need to start drawing a line. And so there's principles that begin to go into play in the way that we relate one with another. And I also want to say everything that the Bible records, just because it records, it doesn't mean the Bible endorses every historical recording. Okay. So we need to understand that. And we need to take the whole context of scripture, the whole context of the Bible and understand that, that God changes that pattern. All right. As it goes down and as it plays out. So let's keep going. Uh, verse 19, Laban said, agreed. I'd rather give her to you than to anyone else. Stay and work with me. So Jacob worked seven years to pay for Rachel. But his love for her was so strong that it seemed to him but few, but a few days. That's a romantic line, isn't it? Finally, the time came for him to marry her. And he said, I have fulfilled my agreement, Jacob said to Laban. Now give me my wife so I can sleep with her. Again, I, that sounds hard. That sounds crude, doesn't it? Now, it, you may have a translation. If you're reading along with me, you have a Bible in hand. You may have a translation that reads, give me my wife so I can be married to her. There's a... Uh, uh, a a Jewish scholar by the name of Robert Alter, he points out that many Middle Middle Eastern writers during this time of history, it was not common for them to use such crude language. But when you look at the original Hebrew language, according to scholars, this is the way it reads. And here's the thing, Bible authors, they're not trying to be crude, they're trying to be honest. They're giving an honest reflection of what's happening. And that's why we see all throughout the recording of scripture the, that the graciousness of God is working through the brokenness and the messiness of man. And so what we are seeing is that for seven years, Jacob had one thing on his mind. Give me Rachel so I can sleep with her. So he goes on, he says, finally, uh, the, uh, wait, no, don't want to read that again. Okay, so, for, so Laban invited everyone in the neighborhood and prepared a wedding feast. But that night, when it was dark, Laban took Leah to Jacob, and he slept with her. And Laban had given Leah a servant, Zilpah, to be her maid. But when Jacob woke up in the morning, it was Leah. What have you done to me, Jacob? Raged at Laban. I worked seven years for Rachel. 
Why have you tricked me? Why have you deceived me? (laughs) The deceiver has been deceived. And this is why I pointed back to that statement from Laban earlier that says, we really are family. Right? This is what Jacob did. And this is now what has been done to Jacob. When, when you look at the, the root of that word tricked or deceived that Jacob used here, it's the same verbal root, the same verbal formation that's at the root of his own name, which means to overreach. And this is exactly what Jacob did with Isaac. He overreached out of his boundaries and he deceived Isaac. So when Isaac reached out and felt his arm, he thought it was his son Esau that he was giving a blessing to. And Laban overreached and overstepped boundaries and he deceived Jacob by giving him Leah. So when Jacob reached out in the dark to his wife, who we thought was Rachel, it was actually Leah and he was deceived. But we're going to notice that Jacob doesn't argue with Laban. He doesn't fight back because I think what happens is Jacob comes face to face with who he is. He's coming face to face with what it's like to be deceived. So we keep going. It's not our custom, Laban Laban says, here to marry off a younger daughter ahead of the firstborn. Jacob finds himself in a firstborn battle again. And Laban replied, but wait until the bridal week is over. Then we'll give you Rachel too, provided that you promise to work another seven years for me. So Jacob agreed to work seven more years. And a week after Jacob had married uh, Leah, Laban gave him Rachel too. And Laban gave Rachel a servant, Bilhah, to be her maid. So Jacob slept with Rachel too, and he loved her much more than Leah. And he then stayed and worked for Laban the additional seven years. This is a crazy, insane love story, is it not? So Jacob's now married to two wives. He's got two servants, which end up becoming two concubines. So Jacob's going to have four baby mamas. It's a messed up, sordid affair. All right? It is. And again, just like incest, there is polygamous relationships that are involved in this situation. And yes, the 12 tribes of Israel are going to come out of these nations. And yes, Jesus Christ is going to come from one of the lines of these individuals. But again, the Bible records everything throughout the history of Jesus Christ. And just because the historical recording is there, it doesn't mean that the Bible endorses everything in it. God is working through the brokenness and the messiness of man. And his grace is showing in all these situations. And everything we see throughout the Bible, polygamy brings nothing but problems. And as we enter this polygamous relationship, just like every other polygamous relationship, there's battles that take place. And there's a birthing battle that begins to take place. It's a birthing battle between Leah and Rachel. Because Leah is desperate for love. Apparently, she has not been loved in her life. And that sadly must be because of the the way her her outward appearance is. And that's wrong. But Leah has not experienced this, and so she's desperate for love. Rachel is desperate to have children. Because she believes, me having kids, that's what's going to give me meaning. And ironically, Leah has no problem giving Jacob children. Rachel has no problem getting affection from Jacob. Both of these women women are getting what the other one wants. And watch what happens. Genesis chapter 30, verse 1. When Rachel saw that she wasn't having any children for Jacob, she became jealous of her sister. And she pleaded with Jacob, give me children or I'll die. Rachel became jealous of Leah. She became envious of Leah. This may be the first time in their life that Rachel ever envied Leah. Right? Right? But because she envied her, because she was jealous, that meant trouble was around the corner. Because envy always stirs trouble. Jealousy always stirs trouble. Look, look at how James, the brother of Jesus, says in James chapter 3, verse 16. Wherever there is jealousy, wherever there is envy and selfish ambition, right? That was her push. It was all selfish ambition. There you will find disorder and evil of every kind. He doesn't mix words, James doesn't. He says, look, if you are being motivated by jealousy, you're being motivated by envy, and it's all for selfish gain, you're not going to find anything but trouble and evil. It's going to produce evil. Because envy is the opposite of contentment. Envy ignores the blessings that it has, and it only focuses on what it doesn't have. So Rachel schemes to have children. And the scheme is going to start through her servant, Bilhah. 
she convinces Jacob to give her a child because she can't have a child through her servant. Does that sound familiar? Jacob should remember what happened with his grandfather. When Abraham heeded the words of Sarah and said, sure, I'll go sleep with Hagar and we'll have a child together. That produced Ishmael. That was outside of the plan of God. But see, Rachel was pushed and moved because she was more interested in what man thought of her and the fact that she likely than the fact that she couldn't have children than she was in what God thought of her. Now, eventually we're going to see that God answers Rachel's prayers and he opens her womb and she has a child and they name him Joseph. And the, the majority of the end of Genesis is going to be focused on what happens in Joseph's life. She has another son by the name of Benjamin. But throughout this whole thing, she was disappointed because she couldn't have a child. But Leah was not without her own disappointment. Leah is looking for love. She's looking to be cherished. And every time Leah has a son or a child, she's hoping that that child is going to bring love from Jacob and bring affection from Jacob. But every time she has a child, it appears that her expectations of what's going to happen diminish. Look at Genesis 29 verse 32. When she has her first child, Leah became pregnant. She gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. For she said, the Lord has noticed my misery. And now my husband will love me. That's her expectation. Look at verse 34. When she has another child, she names him Levi. Surely this time my husband will feel affection for me. Now the long he's not just, I want a deep love. Can I just get some affection from my husband? And then later, Leah stops having children, but later down the road, God allows her to have another child. He says, you're not done. And she gets pregnant again in chapter 30, verse 20. This is her expectation. God's given her a son. It's a good reward. Now my husband will treat me with respect. Do you see the way her expectations are diminishing? She's realizing that if, if I'm going to try, if I'm producing anything for selfish reasons, I'm not going to be fulfilled. The only way that you're going to get what you long for is when you produce under the guidance and under seeking God and praising him. See, if we, if, if we think that I'm, I, if I birth this new thing over here, it's going to give me what I want. If I birth this new thing over here, it's going to give me what I want. If I birth this new thing over here, it's going to give me what I want. But we keep trying to birth new things outside of seeking God and praising God. We're never going to be fulfilled. We're never going to be fulfilled because you can't fulfill the longings of your soul outside the creator of your soul. And if Leah would have seen down the generations, which obviously she couldn't do, but if she could have, she would have seen how blessed she truly was because two of her sons were going to be key figures in the, in the patriarchy of the Israelite nation. Levi was going to be the father of the priestly tribe. Judah was going to be the father of the kingly tribe. Her blood would flow through the veins of Moses and Aaron. Her blood would flow through the veins of the earthly father of Jesus Christ, our Messiah. She couldn't see that far, but she didn't realize she was already blessed. And sometimes we, we get so busy trying to get what we want that we miss what God has already given us. What God has already blessed us with. But I think... Leah may have found something when she had her fourth child, Judah, because I want you to notice what she says whenever Judah is born. Genesis chapter 29, verse 35. Once again, Leah became pregnant. She gave birth to another son and she named him Judah for she said, now I will praise the Lord. And then she stopped having children. I think that this is a, this is a, a written this way to say to us that her goal for having children ended to get love and, 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 and some type of love and, and Jacob cherish her. And now her focus is to praise God. See, I've, I told you early in the series, there's two primary names that are recorded for God in, 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 in the Old Testament, there's Elohim, which gets translated as God. When you see the name God, it's Elohim. And then there's the, the Lord God. And when we see Lord or Lord God, that is typically the name Yahweh or Jehovah. And Yahweh and Jehovah is a, is, is, uh, is a personal, intimate usage of the name. And so Leah is saying, because of, because of God and his personal, intimate relationship with me, I am understanding how truly blessed I am. I'm going to praise God. 
this crazy, insane love story that we're seeing here in Genesis chapter 29, I really believe it reveals some important gospel truths to us. Everything in scripture points to what happens through Jesus Christ. And I believe that what's happening in this passage shows us some important gospel truths. And one of those is that what you are searching for is only found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's only found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Within our souls, within your soul, the way you have been created, within your soul, there are longings. And the longings that you have in your soul, they create a search within you. And you go on a search to fulfill those longings. Erwin McManus wrote an incredible book in the early 2000s called Soul Cravings. And he details three, the three primary cravings of your soul that we're constantly chasing. Intimacy, meaning, and destiny. If you've never read that book, I encourage you to, to get it and read it. It's, it's a great book. But those three longings are in all of us. We are all longing for intimacy of some kind. We're all longing for meaning in our life. We're all longing for a destiny, a future, and to leave a legacy from that destiny. We want that in our life. And and these guys are no different. We're seeing this being played out all through the story. Jacob is longing for blessing. He's chasing blessing around every corner. And he's thinking he's going to get these blessings through riches. He's going to get it through women. He's going to get it through the sex he has with them. He's going to get it in this way. And he'll burn whatever bridges he needs to burn in order to get what he thinks he wants and what his soul is craving. Leah is is craving intimacy. She's craving uh, love. And and she thinks that the only way she's going to be fulfilled is by love and affection from a man and appreciation for what she can give him. Rachel has this longing for meaning. She thinks the only way she's going to be fulfilled is if she has children, she becomes a mom and she becomes a matriarch in a family. And they are all allowing these cravings to create idols in their life, to create substitute gods. And they're chasing things. They're putting things on a platform that they are chasing instead of chasing God and a relationship with God, the true God. They're allowing good things. None of those things are necessary. It's not bad to be a mom. It's not bad to want to be loved. It's not bad to have wealth. Those things aren't bad, but when we take good things and we make them God things, that's bad. And again, you can't fulfill the longings of your soul outside of the creator of your soul. And I don't mean this next statement to sound superficial. I mean it allegorically and going along with the passage of Genesis 29, but what looks like a Rachel now will look like a Leah in the full light of day. Because going from one counterfeit God to another counterfeit God is never going to give you what only the true God can give you. I have no desire to upset any of the Swifties in here. I realize that Taylor Swift has been all over the sporting world news in the last week because she's dating, an, well, seemingly dating an NFL player, but anywho. Uh, she had a song a few years ago called Out of the Woods. And in this song that she does, well, the song's about a relationship that comes, that's on the rocks, comes in, which is basically all of her songs and probably be writing another one about Travis Kelsey soon. But anyway, (laughs) At, at the end of the video, these words pop up on the screen. It says she lost him, but she found herself and somehow that was everything. Oh. That's sweet. It was wrong. (laughs) Because going from one counterfeit God to another counterfeit God is not going to do anything for you. The goal should not be finding yourself. I know people use that all the time. You and I need to find myself. I need to go find myself. You're standing right there. I need to go. I I, got to find myself. The goal is not to find yourself. The goal is to find who you are in God, who he's created you to be. Chase God and discover who, you's call, who he's called you to be. So the, the, the very first uh, gospel truth that I see in this is what you're searching for is only found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. But it leads us to another one. True beauty is not found in who you make yourself become. True beauty comes through Christ. Because see, here's the truth. Outside of Christ, it doesn't matter how beautiful society says you are. Outside of Christ, we are all full of the ugliness of sin. 
It is only in Christ when we are covered under the righteousness of God that we begin to grow in the holiness of God and we become who we are meant to be following him. Listen, God doesn't wait for you to become pure before he starts loving you. God's love begins to purify you. God doesn't wait wait for you to become strong in some way before he can start loving you. God's love strengthens you to be who you need to be. If you're a parent or you've been around parents who had children and those children first learned to walk, right? You, maybe you remember your child or some, a friend's child beginning to learn to walk and that child standing there holding on to something and they let it go. They turn and they take their first step, right? They take their first step. And what happens after that step? They typically fall right flat down on their tushy, right? When your child or your friend's child did that, they took a step and they fell down on their tushy. Nobody jumped up and began to scream at the child. You idiot. How can you not know how to walk? Nobody did that, did they? That'd be horrible. Who would do that? No, you celebrated the step that was taken. You celebrated the step that was taken and then you picked the child up and you helped them move forward. You helped them learn how to take the next step. You helped them learn how to take the next step. And that's exactly what God's love does for us. God's unconditional love is what gives you the ability to walk beautifully with him. You know how Paul writes about his life, Philippians chapter three, verse 12. He he had been talking about how beautiful he was to the Jewish nation because of all of his accomplishments. But once he realized he was outside of Christ, he realized how ugly he truly was. And then he begins to say this. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. Paul is saying, look, I've got a long ways to go. But he says, I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. He says, no, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I don't focus on the fall. I celebrate the step and I keep moving forward. Because God's unconditional love in me moves me forward and moves me to that. God's love is a gift. And that love will produce in us what our soul is craving. What our soul is longing for, that love will produce it. And he'll take all the ugliness of sin that is on the inside of us and he'll make our outside match the beauty of Christ on the inside. So again, we get this truth, this gospel truth that true beauty is not found in who you make yourself become. It's found in who you become in God and in Christ. And what you're searching for can only be found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. One more gospel truth out of this is that God's love is a gift given to you to receive. It's not a reward that you have to strive to earn. Look at Paul's words when he's writing his letter to the church of Rome and the way he's describing the history of Israel in connection and pointing to Jacob, Romans chapter nine, verse 10. This son was our ancestor, Isaac. When he married Rebecca, she gave birth to twins. But before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, she received a message from God. This message shows that God chooses people according to his own purposes. He calls people, but not according to their good or bad works. She was told, your older son will serve your younger son. So, it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor what? Work for it. In other words, God graciously gives his grace and mercy to us. We don't have to do anything to earn it. We receive it. We receive it. When he wrote his letter to Titus, Paul described the grace of Christ this way. Titus chapter three, verse four. When God, our savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through his Holy Spirit. In other words, you're not doing anything to earn it. You receive it. That's the gospel truth. God's love is a gift given to you to receive. It's not something you have to work to understand. And church, when we begin to understand this, you will truly and you will truly freely be able to praise God. See, I, I think sometimes it's hard for us to come in here 
or coming to a place or even, or, or even when we're out on our own to feel like praising God. And we don't feel like we can praise God because we don't feel like we're fulfilled. We feel like we're a disappointment. We feel like we haven't obtained what our soul is wanting. And we think I can't praise God until I've obtained what my soul is longing for. And we just need to stop and begin to praise God. Then our soul will be fulfilled. Stop trying to earn what your soul craves. And just rest in your creator. If you start praising your creator, you'll start feeling a peace in your soul. So see, some of us need to stop trying to fulfill our need for intimacy in a search for companionship. There's nothing wrong with that. I have that in my life. But I knew that that companionship is not what fulfilled me. So stop looking for fulfillment and companionship and just begin to praise God. Stop looking for fulfillment in the stuff that you can get in life. Stop looking for fulfillment in the status that you, you want to try to achieve in life. And instead, start praising God. Stop trying to be perfect and making everyone think you are perfect. And just start praising God. Stop trying to be somebody according to the eyes of people. And just start praising God. See, sometimes we need to sit down everything we're trying to achieve and say, you know what? Now, I'm going to praise God. I'm going to praise God. Because it's when you begin to praise your creator that your soul will truly be fulfilled. Revelation chapter four. Why do I want to take us to the end of the book to see what's happening here in this vision from John? It's because I want us to see what's happening in heaven. What God, what Jesus showed John is happening in heaven because this points to what Jesus is longing for from us now. Revelation Chapter four, verse eight. It says, day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the almighty. The one who always was, who is, who is still to come. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, The 24 elders fell down and worshiped the one sitting on the throne, the one who will live forever and ever. And they lay their crown before the throne and they say, listen to what they say. You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. You are the creation of God. God created you. He created the soul that is within you. He created the longings that are within your soul. And the only way the longings in your soul are going to be fulfilled is when you begin to worship and praise your creator. Because he is worthy of all glory, of all honor, of all power, of all praise. You cannot fulfill the longing of your soul outside of the creator of your soul. Begin to praise your creator. If you need prayer in any way today, we would love for you to reach out to us. You can go to our website, bwccamden.com, go to our contact page. You'll find the link there to uh, request prayer or send us anything that you uh, would like to communicate with us today. Or you can also simply text the word prayer to 803 803- 676-7566 and we will be back in touch with you to find out how we can be in prayer for you. God bless you. We hope that you have a great week.